the gadget. On the evening of April 15, 1943, about 40 physicists gathered in what used to be the library reading room of the Los Alamos Ranch School. A small blackboard on wheels stood at one end of the room. In front of the blackboard were several rows of folding chairs. Everyone took seats except for Robert Oppenheimer and his assistant, Robert Serber. Buildings were still under construction, remembered Serber. There was a hammering off in the background, ca carpenters and electricians working out of sight, but all over the place. Oppenheimer introduced Serber and sat down. Serber looked down at his notes and began reading quietly with a slight stutter, but he opened with a bang. The object of the project is to produce a practical military weapon in the form of a bomb in which the energy is released by a fast neutron chain reaction. There was a second of sound, stunned silence. Until that moment, many men in the room had not known exactly why they'd been dragged to this remote mountaintop. Scribbling graphs and formulas on the blackboard as he spoke, Serber began to explain the physics of an atomic bomb. He wasn't much of a speaker, the physicist Isidore Rabbi recalled, but for ammunition he had everything Oppenheimer's theoretical group had uncovered during the last year. He knew it all cold and that was all he cared about. Serber had the room's attention until a sharp crack interrupted the talk. Startled, everyone looked up. They saw a jagged hole in the thin ceiling above and dangling through the hole the wiggling leg of an ele electrician. The scientists heard the man call for help. They heard men running on the floor above, then saw the leg slowly slide up through the hole and disappear. Serber returned to his lecture. Almost every sentence included the word bomb, which began to worry Oppenheimer. He leaned to the physicist beside him, John Manley, and whispered something. Manley walked up to Serber and told him to stop saying bomb. There were too many workers around. When Serber resumed his talk, he referred instead to the gadget. The name stuck. Around Los Alamos after that, explained Serber, we called the bomb we were building the gadget. In four more lectures over the next two weeks, Serber described the physics of how the gadget might work. Enrico Fermi's Chicago experiment had proved that it was possible to spark a chain reaction in uranium. Fermi's uranium and gra graphite pile had released energy but only a tiny amount, and slowly. The problem facing Oppenheimer's team was to figure out how to create a much faster chain reaction that would release so much energy it would cause a massive explosion, and the whole thing had to be light enough to travel by airplane. In theory, Serber explained, the design of the bomb could be very simple. They could load two pieces of very rare, pure uranium into specially adapted artillery gun. Inside the gun barrel, they would fire one piece of uranium at the other. When the two pieces met, they would form a critical mass, the amount of material needed to get a chain reaction going. The reaction would begin, speedy ne neutrons would hit uranium atoms, which would split, releasing energy and more neutrons. Each fission would release just enough energy to move a grain of sand. But within less than one millionth of a second, so many atoms would fission that the lump of uranium would blow itself apart with the force of millions of pounds of regular explosive. Serber drew a rough sketch of what became known as the gun assembly method. Surrounding the uranium would be a tamper, a shield of very dense metal. The tamper would prevent flying neutrons from escaping, bouncing them instead back into the uranium. This would cause more fission and a bigger explosion. Major questions remained, Serber told the team. Exactly how much uranium was needed to form a critical mass? What material would perform best as a tamper? How fast would the lumps of uranium be needed lumps of uranium needed to be brought together inside the gun? How big an explosion would this type of bomb cause? And of course, would this design even work? We started working immediately, said Richard Feynman. Outside the workrooms, Los Alamos was a disaster. The site itself was a mess, said Robert Serber. It was in shambles, agreed Hans Beth. It was a construction site. You stumbled over kegs of nails, over posts, over ladders. Melting snow sank into the dirt roads, turning them to sticky black mud. And while views of the surrounding mountains and deserts were spectacular, the army built high fences around the entire lab, making the scientists feel like prisoners. The first thing I noticed, remembered Edward Teller, was that we were all going to be locked up together for better or for worse. I was shocked by the isolation, Beth said. 
Clearly, we were very far from anything, very far from anybody. Oppenheimer and his wife moved into one of the five log cabins that had originally been built for school directors, a little group of houses known as Bathtub Row. They had the only tubs up, tubs on the hill. Younger scientists crowded into bunk beds in an old school building while new dorms were being built. Bob Christie and his wife had to go to the bathroom through our bedroom, recalled Feynman, so that was very uncomfortable. As construction continued, Oppenheimer was often seen strolling the streets of his growing town in jeans and a western shirt, his thumbs tucked into his belt. New scientists were arriving all the time, and when the director saw someone he didn't know, he'd stride up to the newcomer. Welcome to Los Alamos, he'd say, smiling, and who the devil are you? To get to work, scientists struggled through the mud to the half-finished tech area, which housed labs and offices and was surrounded by another fence, nine feet high, with barbed wire strung along the top. Military police guarded the only gate 24 hours a day. To gain entrance, scientists had to show their white badges. Only the scientists were issue issued these special photo IDs. Oppenheimer arrived to at the gate of the tech area each morning at 7.30, flashed his white badge, and walked to his office. This was a big change from his Berkeley days. A lover of late-night par parties, he never scheduled class before 11 a.m., but Oppenheimer knew that it wasn't just his reputation and career on the line at Los Alamos. It was the outcome of the biggest war in human history. And in case the pressure wasn't intense enough, President Roosevelt spelled it out in a personal note. Whatever the enemy may be planning, American science will be equal to the challenge, Roosevelt wrote to Oppenheimer. With this thought in mind, I send this note of confidence and appreciation. Oppenheimer thanked Roosevelt for the kind words, adding, There will be many times in the months ahead when we shall remember them. Then came, came a memo from General Leslie Groves. Given Oppenheimer's vital importance to the country, wrote Groves, it is requested that a, you refrain from flying in airplanes of any description. The time saved is not worth the risk. B, you refrain from driving in an automobile for any appreciable distance, above a few miles, and from being without a suitable protection on any lonely road. C, in driving about town, a guard of some kind should be used, particularly during the hour of darkness. These were sensible precautions, but the truth is that Groves had more than safety on his mind. Many of Grove's intelligence officers still didn't trust the Los Alamos director. They believed he was secretly a communist and perhaps even in touch with Soviet agents. They wanted him under constant surveillance. Army counterintelligence corps agents hid microphones in Oppenheimer's office. They, listed, they listened in on his phone calls and read his mail. Even Oppenheimer's personal driver and bodyguard, the one Groves insisted he have, was actually an undercover agent. Oppenheimer sensed he was being watched, but he never guessed how closely. On June 12th, he traveled to Berkeley to recruit more brains for Los Alamos. CIC agents followed him every step of the way.